appreciate your time. I really do. I value your time. And I, most of all, I want to value your input that you'll give throughout this workshop. Prior to the workshop, I implemented a poll online through polleverywhere.com with some questions specifically related to Shady Grove. And it had different areas of interest. I want to go over some of those preliminary results with you, okay? We'll talk more about it at the end during our discussion time, but I want to go over some of this. And this has been pretty universal across the board as I have given this poll in another setting as a test room. And the question was, what area of ministry do you believe receives the least amount of emphasis at Shady Grove Church? What I mean by that question is, which of these four priorities receives the least? Not which doesn't receive any attention. I think all of us would agree it does. Overwhelmingly, 88% of those who took the poll said children's ministry. And by the way, to qualify that, children's ministry, I'm going to call it CM throughout the workshop, so if you hear that term, that's usually what it goes by, it encompasses those that are from newborn to elementary age. So children's ministry. 88%. Now, let me ask you that. Just in a, a very quick question and answer kind of dialogue, why do you think children's ministry gets the least amount of exposure? What do you think? Always kids in the way. Excuse me? They're always kids in the way. They're always kids in the way? All right. Hidden away. Hidden away. I got you. Like their classes. You don't ever see them. Their classes are away. Yeah, that is true. Yeah, absolutely. What else? Heart. Just like heart patients. Mm -hmm. Kids, I mean, especially yeah. when they're running around uh, listening, stuff like that. Especially if they're not yours. <laughs> So, and we'll go through some things on this uh, this evening. Here's the second question. Of, of that area of ministry, now we have one individual who said worship and, and um, the music aspect, but 88%. But of those area of ministry that you identified as needing the most help, um, what do you believe could benefit that area the most? So here are the four options. Large budget. We can always use more money, right? <laughs> um, teacher and worker training. This usually goes with uh, some really uh, instruction, workshops like this. The second one is more personnel. So is it more people? Is it just more bodies? Or is it better curriculum and resources? And I'm surprised that there was no input on that one. Um, but here's what I found fascinating. In the, in when I gave this poll the first time, these were the only two answers given. Gave it to you guys, only two answers given. What does teacher and worker training and more personnel, what's the common factor there? People. People. And so what it does tell us is that the most important aspect, I think, of a successful children's ministry is people. Because you're ministering to, and ministry is all about. So um, I think we see that. Here's the, um, the next question. This was kind of just a gauge. Uh, where we're at. Have you ever worked in, considered working in the ministry that you've identified that needs strengthening? And 75% of you said, I have worked in. 13% says, I have not considered working in. And then 13% says, I am currently working in. So most of you, you're not speaking to this with no experience whatsoever. It's you're not some you're not passive in this, just sitting back saying, there's a lot of problems that need to be met. And a lot of problems that we have, and we need to address them, but you've been involved doing it, which is impressive. And then here's the last, or the second to the last one. How many years have you served in your current ministry role? 50% of the ones in here is one to three years, 25% three to seven years, uh, and then 13%, which is probably one or two in the poll, seven to 15 years. So the majority, we would say this, they have skin in the game. They have skin in the game. And then the last question I asked you to assess yourself. What, what do you think is the gift that you possess? And this is what you said. Children, an organizer, patience, administration. That, they were the top ones. There's other ones that could have been given, but they are the top ones uh, that are given. And I want you to know this. Every single one of them are important. And I'm going to show you that here tonight. In your PowerPoint that you, that you have before you, I want to go through this. This is not a long PowerPoint. It's for you to take notes. The title of this workshop is Children's Ministry, God's Idea. And 
our responsibility. God's idea and our responsibility. Um, twice again, I've given this poll, and overwhelmingly, children's ministry was the top answer in the selection of the, the area of ministry that needs to have the most attention or needs to be strengthened. I think we're blessed here at Shady Grove because not only do we have children's ministry program, not only do we have children, we also have people involved. And so this does not, this does not mean that it's not good. It just means it can be better. And we want to show you the importance of that. So first of all, let me just explain to you the objectives. What are we doing? Why are we doing that tonight? The objective of this workshop is just for us to understand why children's ministry is essential to the local church, and specifically to this one, to this one, all right? So how are we going to do that? A couple of, a few goals that we're going to uh, attempt to do is to instill a passion for children. I think you'll see that through the statistics that we'll give. Uh, assess where we are excelling and where we can do better. That's going to be input here in just a moment that we'll, we'll look at. And then finally, I want to provide you some creative ways of communication. Uh, just an easy way to communicate. If you work in children's ministry right now in some way, shape, or form, whether it's Sunday school, children's church, or Awana, raise your hand. So quite a few of you that are already in here. All right, so let's talk about this. I want to give you, first of all, the biblical precedent of children's ministry. Is, can you by any chance defend uh, children's ministry in the local church biblically? I think that's where you got to start, right? Uh, we have in our doctrinal statement that the Bible is the sole rule of faith and practice, okay? And so let's, let's do this. First of all, the Shema. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6. You guys know what that is? The Lord is one. Our the Jehovah, we are supposed to love him with all your heart, your soul, your strength. You know that verse? Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. But then it says this. Then you are to repeat this to your children. Talk with them. And you're to talk with them in the house. When you're down, going down the road, that just means in daily life. That, or when you're lying down and when you get up, and you're to put it before them at all times. Now that's the command to the parents, is to do this to their children. Now, here's what's fascinating uh, to me, is one author has went through, went through the entire scripture and concluded that all the references to children, parents, and families, and instruction that is to be given total some 8,000 references. That's important. Uh, there are some doctrines that we hold dear to us that are only mentioned a few times in Scripture. But some 8,000 times there's mention of families and parents and instruction throughout the Scriptures. I think there's an emphasis that God was attempting uh, to communicate. So the first one is the Shema. That was a command that every faithful Jew was to recognize. The second one that we really could pinpoint is in, Deut in Joshua chapter 4. After the children of Israel had crossed the Jordan, they're in Canaan. And Joshua gives this fascinating command to make memorial stones. So as they crossed, they've gone into Canaan land. They were to make memorials symbolizing the faithfulness of God. And so any time then that those families were to travel back to that area, that area where they had crossed the Jordan, they could look at them and their parents could tell them, let me tell you what God did. What was the purpose of that? To pass it on to the generations. Pass it on to the generations. Let me give you another one. Psalm 8, 1 and 2. Psalm 8, 1 and 2. This is a fascinating one that the, the Lord sits in the heavens high and exalted. And it says out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. And then it says it will steal the mouth of the avenger. What in the world is that referencing? As Michaela White said, that when you create a space for children to worship, you actually quiet the mouth of the enemy. That's the idea. That when we give the opportunity for a child to worship, it quiets the mouth of the enemy. Uh, and then finally, I'll give you this one that every one of you know, Matthew 18. Everyone's arguing with Jesus, talking about who's going to be on the kingdom of God, who's going to have this, and who's going to have that. And then Jesus looks at him and says, let me just tell you the truth. The kingdom of heaven will be like this child. And you allow them to come unto me. And if you forbid it, 
it's better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and be cast into the sea. <laughs> What's he saying? The way that you come to faith in Christ is like a child comes to his father. They trust him. So parent, the parent-rental relationship that we see throughout the scriptures, the idea of instruction is throughout the scriptures. Now, I know exactly what you probably just thought. Well, that's to the parents. Would you agree? Now, I do too. However, in Christ, Clark, you are my brother, right? And you're my sister. And we're called the family of God. Would you agree with that? And we're called the community of faith. And so while you have responsibility to teach your children, and I certainly have responsibility to teach my children, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. So guess what? We're to help one another. And so why is children's ministry so important to the local church? Is because it's the command that the family is supposed to be engaged in. Think about it that way. So when Miss Erica is teaching your children in children's church or in Awana, she's actually engaging in the biblical man to train the children in the way of the Lord. It's a biblical command because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Let me show you though why it's so important. In 2019, there were some statistics given. Uh, several hundred churches were taken. I'm going to give you multiple. This is just kids ministry leaders. Uh, and these statistics have proven to be accurate even in 2021. Okay? Um, th there's two important numbers up on this screen. I don't want to deal with a lot, but I want to deal with the most important, I think. Is that two-thirds of every profession of faith in Christ. Notice that. It's talking about different kids leaders. It's talking about different churches. But 66% of every profession of faith happened before age 18. And of that 66%, 43% took place before age 12. So think about this. Of all the professions of faith that were cataloged and surveyed, the majority of them are taking place with children that are 12 and under. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Where else? What else do you think? Why, why do you think kids are so they easily trust what they're being told? They're less inundated by the world. Yeah. They're less exposed to everything that's out there, so it's easier to trust. Absolutely. Teaching in a college setting, I have a bunch of most of those are generally 18, 22 year old, and most of them have already have presuppositions that they're living by. They already, they already got it figured out. No, they already got it figured out. But they, they, they pretty much have it figured out, right? Uh, but when you take a child, listen, they have presuppositions. They have things they think is right and things wrong, but they are way more impressionable. And we can say what we want to, and we're seeing maybe some degeneration of that in our culture. But with this young age group, they st there is still a level of authority that they respect. Um, and so we're, we're seeing that. Let me give you some other statistics from uh, what's, what they're called the ministry architects. And this is totally about um, children's ministry. 586 churches were surveyed. Um, different, and by the way, these were all families who regularly attended church. And by regularly, they meant twice or more a week. That's pretty good. Um, okay. Families with kids and, ch and children's ministry are among the most active participants in the local church. 59%. They invest, the kids, it's 52, 52% 52 of them who have kids in children's ministry, 52% of those families are at a church more than 10 years. That's longevity. In other instances, I've read that some individuals, they actually will change churches every couple of years just to find something for their kids. As their kids uh, kind of mold into a different age group, uh, if they're juniors, they'll find something. Well, once that junior program's over, they'll find something for the teenagers. So they're going where their kids are. Now, that's not leadership. That's fallowship at that point. But what, but what does it tell us? Parents are at least concerned about their kids. You know? <laughs> Good, bad, or indifferent, they're at least concerned about their kids. Let me give you some more. Um, with kids involved in the church ministry, either through taking up the offering, through singing, 57% of families said, we'll tithe. 
If their kids are actively and visibly involved, they said, we'll tithe. Now, we, we put that question on the board there a little bit ago about the larger budget. Let me give you an interesting statistic about that. According to some research, some churches are investing $1,100 per kid a year in the children's ministry program. Now, how do you calculate that? Some of it is through the staff members that they hire, the activities that they have, the budget that they have, and, and calculating that, it, it comes out to be about $1,100. Like if you take a parent's time, who's if we were to take your guys' time and what you guys spend in Awanas and try to compensate you for it, it would be pretty great. <laughs> you know? But they, they were, they're saying that it's somewhere around $1,100 per child is what the church really is investing per year. Interesting statistic. 62% of families uh, in, in children's ministry said that the deciding factor that kept them in church was what their children were getting. 62%. 69% of families decided that children's ministry would be the deciding factor in remaining in church after their children graduated. That's fascinating. How, their church, how, how the church handled their children would be the deciding factor whether they stayed when their children were gone. And then, this is the big one. 62% of families said, I, I'm not shocked by this one, that having an active children's ministry change their children's behavior at home. So it's noticeable. It's not just about what you have, it becomes noticeable. So I would say the biblical precedence there, the, the statistics and the analysis is all over the place with children's ministry. You can find this in many, many places. So let's talk about us. We've got 10 minutes left, so we got to book it, right? we got 10 minutes. We have an exercise that you probably see in that, that paper It's keeping growth. And so I want to take the time to do this. I want you to take that. And I want us to think, in the keep side, what are some areas of children's ministry at Shady Grove Church right now? Um, whether it's people, whether it's the, the curriculum, whether it's the timing, whatever the case may be. You would say, we absolutely must keep these. You cannot get rid of these. These are bedrock to who we are as a church. So let's talk about it. Let's just add a few of these, some things that we need to keep. This is time for you to do as much input as possible. What do you think? A wand. You say that's an absolute keeper. Okay. Any explanation on a wand? Well, I've heard of verses that they learn between puzzles and PMP is astronomical. So memorization of scripture. Yeah. Hiding it in the heart. A wand is fascinating at that. Does a great job. Yeah. Okay. That's a keeper. All right. And then you don't have to agree with this list. It's just some things, you know, that we can put down. What else are those things? Yes. It's good. Finding the balance between having the, the children have their own place of worship and then in, engaged in the in family worship is, is difficult. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of differing opinions on that. Um, but I think if you get the place of kid where the kids can truly worship instead of just play, um, you really will prepare them for the next step when it, you know when that time comes. It shouldn't, be, it shouldn't be any different than what's taking place in our service, I personally, than just on a different level. Yeah. Okay? What are some other things you think that we need to keep? Seeing a junior camp during the summer? Absolutely. Yeah. Junior camp. Yeah. It's good. Anything else? I'll do one more. We don't have to do all five. Oh. And I think that since our pastor's in here tonight, he would say, Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, let's go over to the next idea of grow. What do you think? And again, this isn't that it's not here. You just think it could be done better, that maybe there could be more intentionality in some areas. What do you think are some areas that could grow? Kids' choir. Oh. Kids' choir. Okay. I think the nursery could grow to the point where we divide out between older kids and new babies so that you can actually do a lesson with the two and three year olds because they actually absorb whichever you, you teach them. But when you have so many, you're not able to do that. So nursery growth no. and... Um, like a split of the nursery between toddlers and infants. All right. Yeah. Okay. Summer outreach. 
Summer average. Summer average. Okay. <clears throat> kind of goes along with that, but just growing numerically with kids, the number of kids that we are able to minister to and versus what we are ministering to. Mm. Yeah. It's good. A lot of a lot of good feedback here. Any more before we we don't want to move on from that. Discussion is probably the most important part of this workshop, to be totally honest with you. I was wondering how long it would take on that one. Really. And, and let, me, let me just share this with you. It's in my notes to share in just a moment, but I'll do it now. Oftentimes, in most churches, this isn't, this isn't unique to Shady Grove by no stretch of the imagination. In fact, I don't know if it's, it's been part of every church I've been in. Um, maybe with the exception... Uh, of gateway because again it was a much much larger ministry but most of the time in the church our size you have one or two paid staff members if you have a secretary that's great you know and so they're going to mostly dedicate their time to the preaching and ministry of the word and the oversight of the church agree and then mostly the second guy is going to deal with teens that's that's general all right um, we do in Free Will Baptist have some that we deal with children's ministry, but they're much larger churches. Children's ministry generally does not have the, quote, listen carefully, trained professional that is overseeing children's ministry. So as a result, the, the number is like 86 or so percent of all the workers in children's ministry are volunteers. It has the largest group of volunteers over any ministry whatsoever, even more so than music. And so I think you're right. Uh, and, and again, we can't expect our pastor and, and Brother Marcus to, to train everybody and everything, right? Uh, eventually, it's to train people to do the work of the ministry. And so I think that is a big one. And we're going to deal with that here in just a moment. So, One more, really quickly. Anybody? Okay. What's that? Go ahead. BBF. BBF. I, I would say, yeah, that could, whether it's grow or keep across the board and everything I've read, BBS is the church's focal point during the summer months. You, there's a lot of exponential growth that can take place just because of BBS. Most parents will send their kids to BBS. All right. Okay. Next, last page. So if children's ministry is so essential, how then do we effectively communicate Christianity to children? Please, I'm not naive enough to think this is going to fix the world's problems. But I'm going to give you three very clever clues as to how you can effectively communicate to a child. Number one, it's just preparation. Our pastor's in here tonight, which is good. But... But Clark, what would you think would happen if uh, Sunday morning our pastor got up and he said, man, Saturday was a long day. And uh, it's just been a really long week. <coughs> he's, got, he's got a bunch of kids at his house too that could benefit from children's ministry. He says, I just didn't have time. I just didn't have time to prepare. I just did not have time to prepare and be with the flock of God this morning. And he said, I tell you, so we're going to get up and all we're going to do today is it's we're just going to sing your favorite hymns. And he did that one week. You think it'd be all right one week? Yeah. I think I think we'd give him a free pass on that. Salary might be cut for that one week, you know, but he could have But what if he did it like three or four weeks in a row? They would be like, well, you need, you need to get busy about something else, you know. You need Jesus. <laughs> we have business meeting. There would be a yeah, And we got one of our men on board in here tonight, too. There'd be a business meeting. So let me ask you that. No, nobody will say that the pastor should not take time to prepare his lesson, to know what he's going to say, how he's going to say it, what's important in it. Why would that be fair to kids then? It, it's much harder to prepare for kids than it is to anybody else. Because you got to think on their level. Yeah. What can they understand? What will they understand? What will they keep? Yeah, and that moves me to the second one, which is here's the second one, clarity. I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a story very quickly, and I'm going to show you a practical way of driving the point home. So let's say that in your children's church lesson, it is the parable of the good Samaritan. So what are you going to do? I'll tell you what most of us end up doing, myself included. I get caught up on all the details, right? 
What does it mean he's going out from Jericho? What does it mean that a priest came by? What does it mean that a Levite came by? What does it mean that he put him on a donkey? What does it mean he paid two pence? What does it mean that he, what is this end? What is all this going on? And we miss the entire parable. We miss the parable and the point of the parable. Now, I'm going to give you a little help on this. A, a parable generally only has one point. There's a lot of details, but only one point. That's the use of a parable. Now, what is the purpose of that parable? You say, well, what was that? Love your neighbor, right? So what does it mean to love your neighbor? Well, if you go back, Jesus is asked this question. Good master, what must I do to have eternal? He says, well, you love God. He says, ah, I've done that for my youth. And then he says, he's told, oh, love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, ah, oh, well, who's my neighbor? So he gives him the parable, and at the end of it, it's this wretched Samaritan, right? And it's evident that that man is not going to love anybody like that Samaritan. So again, what was the point of the parable? It's what do I do to have eternal life? That man obviously didn't love his neighbor, which means he didn't love God, which means he didn't have eternal life. What's the point of the parable? There's nothing you can do to have eternal life because we can't even keep two basic commands, love God, love our neighbor as ourselves. I will tell you this when it comes to teaching children, and Brother Greg, you bring up a great point. We don't need all the details. They need the main thrust and drive that one point home. So if I'm teaching on the parable of the Good Samaritan, if I'm preaching it on a Sunday morning, there's probably more details. But if I'm preaching it to children, I want to drive home this one thought that Jesus drove home. By the way, he's driving home just one thought. There's nothing you can do to have eternal life. But in Christ, you can. And that's what I'm driving home. Now, here's the last one. Creativity then. Now, I, to do that, I, I'm going to do this. And then I'm, I'm literally out of time. Most of the time in children's church, we preach stories. Would you agree? Jonah and the whale, big fish. Uh, David and Goliath would preach a story. Can you take profound, I'm talking about profound theological truths, like imputed righteousness, can you take profound truths and make it to a kid can understand? Absolutely. Absolutely. This takes creativity and this takes time. So let me let me show you if, if I were to do it, how I would do this. This is just a bottle of water. I probably want to smell it. Just make sure it's water. No, you trust me. All right, I just make it sure. This is just some some good old H2O. And, and I'm gonna I'm not gonna teach it like I would to a child because I'm not gonna teach you as a child. Um, but I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. This is iodine. Everybody know what this is for? This is to stain your skin and make you burn. If you don't believe in hell, you will have to put this on yourself, okay? Because it burns. Let's just say you teach a child, and you're teaching from Romans about Christ imputing his rights, or Corinthians, Second Corinthians 5, we'll go there, of Christ imputing his righteousness to us. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you're going to have to explain to a, a child that somehow... You who were dirty and wretched and filthy and s sinful, that now you're made clean. How could you do that? Well, just a good old bottle of water and some iodine. And then what I would do is I would say, what does sin mean? So give me a sin, Austin. Stealing. You confess it something? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I'm going to add that to it. So what happened to my water? This is profane. This is, this is, this is what will get you a job teaching college, okay? All right. What else? What are some other sins? Why? Confession? <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm getting it everywhere. What else? Give me some more sins. Greg, give me some sins. Having your phone on during a workshop. <laughs> By the way, I was going to say that's my wife, but if I do that, I'll anyway. uh, Anybody else? Her. <laughs> <laughs> that's my feet anyway. That's what so what is that? <laughs> so at this particular point, this is your life. And we would say that at, at, at childbirth, look how, look what it was, right? It looked clean or whatever, but it had the capability to receive this because that's what it enjoys. And so this now is your life. This is how God views your life. But to have the imputed righteousness, you need Jesus. And when you get Jesus added to your life, it washes away sin. It doesn't mean that it takes away what you've done, but it takes away the penalty. And all of a sudden you add Jesus in, and what takes place? And now I have his imputed righteousness. And so now that when God looks at me, what does he see? Purity and holiness. 
And so, can you take this profound theological truth and make it easily accessible to a child? Absolutely. And by the way, you can go online and find thousands of these kind of illustrations that will help you. But children remember creativity. And by the way, Jesus was the master of it. You know, whether it was a coin and a fish, um, whether it was a fig tree, whether it was sowing and seeds, he was the master illustrator of what it was to teach something that people could grab a hold of and do it in a way. All right. At this time, what I'm going to do is we're going to close and then we're going to have a time of discussion. So, if we can, Mr. Patrick, it's good to have you here. Would you close us in a word of prayer before we have our time of discussion? Definitely.